Drug violence along the U.S.-Mexico border dipped in 2011, but the numbers are still staggering across Mexico. On average, 47 people were killed each day last year, 10 of whom were youths. David Shirk of the Transborder Institute at USD is here to talk about the numbers and gives us his analysis of what it all means. By how much did drug-related violence go down along the U.S.-Mexico border last year? Uh, the overall share of violence along the border went from about 50 percent of all drug violence in Mexico in 2010 to about 44 percent in 2011. And what we saw in specific places like Tijuana and Ciudad Juarez was a drop of about 30 percent, about a third of the violence in those cities, which is a huge gain for uh, the border region. The problem is that in other parts of the border region like Tamaulipas and, um, and Nuevo Leon, we saw some increases and importantly elsewhere in Mexico, in central Mexico, we saw very significant increases in violence. We have a graphic from your report that shows the drug-related murders in 2011. Tell us a little bit about what we're seeing and why did we see a decline in violence at our local border city, Tijuana? One thing that this graphic shows is how concentrated the violence is in a very small number of municipalities in Mexico. In fact, 5 percent, uh, uh, sorry, 25 percent of the violence that we saw last year uh, in drug-related violence was concentrated in just five cities in, in Mexico. Uh, places like Juarez uh, and Acapulco uh, are, are uh, highly concentrated locations of violence. But um, the violence in, along the border went down quite significantly in Tijuana, and Ciudad Juarez in part because the, the conflicts between drug trafficking organizations in those places died down. The, um, the, the, particularly the Sinaloa cartel appeared to gain ground in both of those places and was able to get back to business as usual, shipping drugs to the United States. While the resident cartels that had long occupied those spaces, the Tijuana cartel and the Juarez cartel, seemed to lose ground and had to cede some uh, authority to the, the Sinaloa cartel. So in effect, the, the reduction in competition, the, the resolving of differences between those organizations led to a reduction in violence. So it doesn't mean that government authorities are simply looking the other way? Well, there were certainly important arrests in uh, both of those uh, places, and there have been some significant gains for law enforcement. But at the end of the day, when you look at the flows of drugs in both places, uh, they, they remain unabated. And if anything, we're seeing more drugs coming across in both places than we had before. So uh, the success of law enforcement has not mitigated the capabilities of organized crime groups operating in those areas. There are no doubt some corrupt authorities involved, police officers, maybe some elected officials, but at the end of the day, the, um, the, there are real law enforcement efforts being done to try to control organized crime, and unfortunately, they are not adequately successful. So the drop in violence has been offset by increases in violence elsewhere in Mexico, um, with the exception of the Sinaloa drug drug cartel and um, Los Zetas, some of these drug cartels have actually weakened. They've splintered. But which cartel is running the show in Tijuana? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, we don't know exactly uh, how badly the Tijuana cartel, which has long been run by the Ariano uh, Felix family, we don't know how weakened it is. There have been numerous arrests. Uh, several of the brothers have been arrested. Uh, one was killed in the last decade. Uh, but it, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that the Sinaloa cartel has effectively moved into Tijuana, is able to move drugs through Tijuana. We found two big tunnels in December. So it, we think that Sinaloa has taken over Tijuana. Now, you write that the U.S.-Mexico anti-drug partnership remains strong, but we're coming off a year of revelations that the U.S. Uh, Bureau of Alco Alcohol tobacco firearms and explosives allowed weapons to be smuggled into Mexico with the idea of tracking them to drug cartel leaders. But now hundreds of those weapons they've lost track of. What effect has that had on the U.S.-Mexico partnership? Surprisingly, it has not caused frictions uh, in between the United States and Mexico, certainly not at the level that we've seen between Democrats and Republicans in Washington who are fighting over this issue. Um, the 
the U.S.-Mexico relationship has improved dramatically since the 1980s when there was a lot of tension between both countries over the drug issue. Uh, there's a higher degree of confidence and, and trust between U.S. and Mexican authorities. We are extraditing, uh, or Mexico is extraditing more criminals from Mexico to the United States than ever before. So that trust, I think, has allowed U.S. and Mexican authorities to overcome serious setbacks like the Fast and Furious operation that you mentioned uh, and other investigatory snafus that, that have occurred recently. Now you believe that there needs to be serious consideration of alternatives to the current drug policy. What are those alternatives? Well if at the end of the day um, the best answer to reduce violence in Mexico is to allow drug traffickers to get back to business as usual. Uh, that to me f seems to be a very cynical outcome uh, for the 50,000 people who've been killed in the last five years, 10,000 people a year, almost on par with what we've seen in the Vietnam War. My suspicion is that the best way to get at the consumption problem is to investigate legalization as an alternative, uh, but we haven't seriously asked that question. Most politicians are afraid to think about legalization, uh, even though there's growing political will in the United States in places like California, Colorado will be considering it this year for marijuana. So I think we need to at least ask the question of what could happen with legalization. David Shirk, thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you so much.